the, beha the behavior of random processes in which there's some value that fluctuates step by step or through time uh, come up just all the times and in all sorts of areas. I mean, a standard one would be looking at the fluctuation of stock prices from moment to moment uh, or uh, the movement of particles under Brownian motion or even the behavior of uh, internet users as they click on links. All of these can be modeled as random walks on a graph. We're going to study one of the simplest ones that's also kind of interesting and fun because of the a phenomenon that it exhibits, namely gambler's ruin, which can be regarded as a random walk going back and forth along a line. Let's look at the problem. And we'll begin by uh, trying to analyze the issue of the probability of winning this so-called game. So gambler's ruin is a setup where you're going to place unit bets, call them $1 bets, uh, uh, until going broke or hitting a target. Uh, and uh, so there's a probability of winning each bet. You're going to keep playing, uh, making the $1 bets until you hit some pre-specified target T uh, or you go, lose, run out of money. That's called going broke. So if we graphed it, what you have is N is your initial capital. Um, and T is your target. You're aiming for dollars is on the vertical axis. So you're starting with N. You're trying to get up to T. And if you ever hit the X axis, that's when you've run out of money and the game ends there. So the game ends when you uh, track step by step your fluctuating amount of money until you either hit the upper boundary or the lower boundary, at which point you've won if you reach your target and terminate at the top boundary or you're ruined or you've lost or gone bust or bankrupt if you run out of money and hit the bottom boundary. So just to illustrate one of the motivations that I mentioned, uh, here's an actual picture of the fluctuation of uh, uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is a, a composite of, the, of stock market behavior, tracked over a period of five years. Uh, and uh, it looks vaguely like this kind of random uh, walk gambler's ruin phenomenon. Of course, there's no upper bound on that it's aiming for, but uh, the fluctuations that these prices show resemble the random fluctuations where you are randomly likely to go up or down, although there's a bias in this clear bias toward the upside, which corresponds to making these unit bets with a probability of winning that's greater than a half but still probabilistic and not reliable. So here's the uh, way we're going to set it up. In a fair game, what that means is that the probability of winning a bet is 50-50. There's no bias either way. Uh, and let's just sort of ask what's going to happen. Suppose I ask, what's the probability of hitting $200, goal, my target goal, if I start with 100? Well, if you think about it, 100 is midway between 0 and 200. So by symmetry, it's clear that the probability of hitting the upper boundary is the same as hitting the lower boundary. It's going to be 50-50. Probability of doubling your stake before you go bankrupt is 50-50. Well, suppose it's less symmetric. Suppose I start with $500 and I'm just aiming to make $100 more. Um, and what's the probability there? Well, I don't know whether it's obvious or not. It's not, it hasn't been obvious to me, but the fact is that the probability of winning $100 if you start with a larger stake, namely $600, is five-sixths. The more money you have in the fair game, the more likely it is that you're going to earn $100 before you go broke. And that might be an intuitive idea, although we'll see that intuition is dangerous in this problem. So in general, the theorem is that we will actually derive uh, is that the probability of hitting the target T is equal to the quotient of your initial stake N divided by the target T in the fair game. That's a general result, which was illustrated in the previous two cases of 100 over 200 was a half or, or starting with N equals 500 over a target of 600 gives you a 5 sixth probability of winning. Well, what happens with the unfair game? Um, and there things get a little more unexpected and complicated. So let's look at a concrete example of a slightly unfair game. Uh, in, uh, on a roulette table, there are uh, 36 numbers colored red and black plus two double zeros. Uh, and you can place a bet on black. And of course, uh, that means that there are 18 out of 38 possible uh, numbers that the little ball might land on. And if it lands on a black one, you win, the probability is 9 out of 19, or slightly less than a half, um, that uh, you will win if you bet on black. This is not a, a grossly biased game for one bet. 
And so what we can do is ask the same question that we ask in the fair case. What's the probability of hitting a target of $600 if you have an initial stake of $500. That is, I have $500, I'd like to win another $100, which we analyzed in the fair game as being five sixths. And you might think that with this slightly unfair game, uh, the, uh, the odds would be a little lower, but would they be dramatically lower? Well, it turns out they are. With a, an initial stake of $500, trying to win $100, there's one chance in 37,000, less than that, that you will actually manage to win $100 before you go broke. You're almost certain to go broke. As a matter of fact, you could ask, suppose I had an initial stake of a million dollars and all I wanted to do was win $100. Well, it turns out, well, of course, and again, in the fair game, this is almost certain that you'll win $100 with a million dollar initial stake before you go broke. But in this unfair game, only slightly unfair per bet, it's still one, one in 137,000 that you will win. As a matter of fact, it doesn't matter how much money your initial stake is. The probability of your winning just $100 more remains one in $137,000, which I think is dramatically unintuitive and surprising. And we'll, we'll prove that shortly. Uh, but that's the story that, you, that you're being told in order to capture your interest. So the way we abstract the gambler's ruin problem is there, there are three parameters. One, para uh, one parameter is the probability that you will win a $1 bet, a bet. Uh, if P is greater than a half, the game is biased in your favor. If P is less than a half, the game is biased against you. And if P equals a half, it's a fair game per bet. The other parameter was N, the initial capital, and T, your target, which is supposed to be greater than or equal to N, that you're aiming for, and you'll win when you hit T, or you'll lose when you uh, wind up with a, a current working capital of zero. You've run out of money. And what we're asking is, what's the probability that you hit the target? Uh, now, let's make a quick remark that, the that once you've understood the probability of hitting the target, you've also understood the probability of going broke because the claim is that the probability of going broke, of ruin, is simply one minus the probability of winning. Now, that, again, is not completely obvious. It depends on the fact that it's impossible to keep playing. So if you know, the point is, if you know the probability of winning, you know the probability of ruin and vice versa. Uh, and the reason is that you can't play forever or the probability of playing forever is zero. How can we argue that? Well, however much money you have, um, if you're thinking about, again, a, a fixed target of T um, and a given probability of uh, a given bias on the flip, then no matter what amount you have between zero and T, um, it's assuming that P is not uh, zero or one, there's a positive probability that the next T bets will, you'll win, which means you'll hit the upper bound. Um, uh, it may be unlikely, but it, it, uh, it doesn't matter what you have initially because we're just, no matter where you are initially, if you win T consecutive times in a row, you'll hit the target and the game will end. So the probability that the game ends in fewer than T bets is greater than some fixed amount, namely the probability of winning to the teeth power, that's epsilon, uh, and it's a positive number. So that means wherever I wind up, the next T bets I'm, uh, have an epsilon probability of winning. So that means that if I don't win after the next T bets, I'm back at some place where I have some stake that's neither uh, N or zero, that's neither T nor zero. So the probability of winning in the next T steps after that is another one, is another um, uh, one minus epsilon of continuing. And the probability of continuing for K times T steps is less than one minus epsilon to the k. Since I have a probability of at least epsilon of stopping in the next t, uh, in the next t steps, the probability of continuing through the next key steps is one minus epsilon, and the probability of doing that k successive times is one minus epsilon to the k. So in short, as k grows, the probability is going to zero that I keep playing for k t steps. So the probability that I play for an indefinite number of steps is um, uh, less than any amount, uh, any positive amount, because by raising a number less than one, one minus epsilon to the kth power, I can make it as small as I like. In short, the probability, so the probability of playing forever is, uh, uh, it can be forced to be as close to zero as you like, which means it's zero. Okay, back to the main story. The way we're gonna figure out the probability of winning is by thinking of the target T as fixed, 
um, and uh, uh, and the probability of a bet p of winning is fixed. And we're only going to look at how winning depends on the parameter n of the amount of money you have initially. And let's define Wn then to be the probability that starting with n dollars, you will eventually hit your target t before you go bankrupt. And now the trick for figuring out what Wn is, is to do a total probability argument conditioning on the first bet. So what we can say about W, what's the probability of winning if with an initial stake of n, given that you win the first bet? Well, if you win the first bet, that means you have n plus one dollars. So you're now in a state where uh, your probability of winning is simply w sub n plus one. And similarly, uh, if you lose the first bet, uh, the, uh, the probability of winning starting with n, given that you lose the first bet, is simply the probability of winning when you start off with one fewer dollar, namely wn minus one. So by total probability, what I can say is that wn is equal to wn plus one times p, the probability of winning, plus wn minus one times q, the probability of losing the next bet. Okay, well, that's just a linear recurrence. Look at that. Let's reformulate it as a linear recurrence. So Wn plus 1 is equal to 1 over P Wn minus Q over P Wn minus 1. And what's more, we have some initial conditions. W0 is 0. That is, the probability of winning if you start off broke is 0 because you're broke. And likewise, the probability of winning if you're already at your target is 1 because that's when you're supposed to stop. So these provide boundary conditions that enable me to solve the linear recurrence. And if we carry through the solution process, which I'm not going to repeat, but we know how to solve these kinds of linear recurrences, what we wind up with is that Wn is equal to r to the n minus 1 over r minus 1 uh, times W1, the uh, probability of winning if you start off with one dollar. Now we don't actually know what W1 is. So when we're solving the recurrence for Wn, we have to keep W1 as a parameter. But we discover that Wn is equal to r to the n minus 1 over r minus 1 times W1. Again, assuming here that the denominator is not zero. So we're assuming that the uh, ratio r that we define to be q over p is not one. All right. Um, now, we can get over the fact that we don't know what W1 is by simply saying, well, this relation always holds, so I do know what Wt is. It's 1. So if I plug in 1 for t, I get that, uh, if I plug in t for n, rather, Wt becomes, the left-hand side becomes 1. This becomes r to the t, and I can solve for W1. And when I do that, I wind up, after simplifying this formula with my solution for W1, with this nice clean formula, Wn is equal to r to the n minus 1 over r to the t minus 1. Now, th that formula is a very lovely and simple formula, r to the n minus 1 over r to the t minus 1, but we can uh, get a cleaner understanding of how it behaves if we just can get rid of the ones. And you can get rid of the ones in the case that, um, uh, that Q, the, or the number r, q over p, is greater than 1. That is, uh, in the case when you're less likely to win, to win a bet than lose, so it's biased against you by some amount, it's unfair but biased against you, then in that case, this number r is greater than 1. And when you look at a fraction where the numerator, this number uh, r to the n is bigger than r to the t because the target is bigger than the initial stake. Uh, when you have a small number divided by a big number uh, and you take one away from each, uh, you get a fraction that is actually smaller than if you just took the smaller number over the larger number. This is elementary arithmetic, which you should verify. But the claim is that given that uh, r to the n is a uh, positive number that's bigger than r to the t, then uh, you, if you add one to both numerator and denominator, you get something bigger. So Wn is less than r to the n over r to the t, which of course can be simplified to be written as uh, r to the n minus t. And since t is bigger, let's get the exponent to be positive. I'll write it as 1 over r to the t minus n. Now, t minus n, if you think about it, is the profit that you're aiming for. You started off with n dollars. Your target is t. Remember, you started off with $500. You're trying to win $100, so your target was 600. The 100 is the 600 minus 500. So your intended profit is t minus n. And what we have is this general result, which is that uh, in the biased game against you, 
the probability of winning, starting with n dollars, is less than 1 over r to the intended profit. Now, this bound on Wn it now has the virtue that it doesn't depend on n, which is why we could make these assertions about the probability of winning no matter how much you had initially. It depends only on your intended profit. And in particular, we were looking at the case that r was greater than 1 and 1 over r is less than 1. So what this means is that I've got some number that's less than 1 and I'm raising it to the intended profit. So it's decreasing exponentially in how greedy I am and how much money I want to win. So let's plug in some actual numbers to look. So if, the, if I'm playing roulette where the probability P is 18 38 of slightly biased against, which means the probability Q of is 20 over 338, which is slightly in my favor, or sorry, it's slightly greater than a half, then in that case, 1 over R is 9 tenths. So what we can conclude is that the proper probability of winning $100, no matter how much I start with, is less than 9 tenths to the 100th, which is where I got the 1 in 37,000 number. Um, suppose you want to win $200. Well, this is exponentially decreasing. So that means that the probability of winning twice as much is uh, the square of the probability of winning the given amount. So it's going to be 1 in 137th squared, which is about 1 in 70, uh, 70 million. So forget winning $200. It's just not likely to happen in, uh, in your lifetime, or at least in a long time if you're betting at some rate like uh, once a minute. And uh, that tells us this nice story about gambler's ruin in the case biased against. Well, let's look at the fair case. Um, slightly different things happen because now in the fair case, remember we had this formula r to the n minus 1 over r to the t minus 1. And uh, when r is 1, this formula is a 0 over 0 and it doesn't apply. So I can't divide by 0 and make use of this formula to figure out what wn is in the fair case that r equals 1. But uh, I can think of the case r equals 1 as the limit uh, of the case that r is uh, greater than 1 and is approaching 1. So I can use L'Hopital's rule. I just differentiate the numerator and denominator and I get um, the derivative of r to the n minus 1 dr is n r to the n minus 1 uh, dr, dr to the t dr is t r to the t minus 1 uh, and the uh, quotient then is equal to n over t when remembering that we're interested in the case that r is 1. So r to the n minus 1 becomes 1, r to the t minus 1 becomes 1, which is the result that we were claiming earlier about the behavior of the fair case.